Ladies and gentlemen, Vernon Foster, a.k.a. Mr. Mashwell here, livebythebeat.com. Got a special guest in the house this evening, good buddy of mine. Um, actually uh, asked him to be my mentor this year. I'm excited to have Glenn Morgan on with us today. He is the founder and CEO of the world-renowned Future Sound of Breaks brand. He started producing top-notch dance music events in Florida over a decade ago and is widely respected and known in the industry for hosting the FSOB Miami Massive. It takes place <laughs> takes place during uh, Miami Music Week. So, um, you know, Glenn, excited to have you on the show, man. Thanks for thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Let's let's just hop right into it, man. Um, where and when did you get your start in the industry? Well, uh, I started out as a as a dancer in the industry in the mid nineties. And uh, I ended up being into the scene. I, I went to my first rave in, in uh, mid-90s. It was actually the end of 94. Uh, went full throttle with the whole industry and scene of things in 1995. Went to a lot of parties that influenced my life and influenced my career. And then uh, ended up being into the parties while I was going to college in Tallahassee and in Gainesville. And did my travels. And then I started doing street promotions for some of the successful promoters at the time in 1997 in Gainesville. And that's when I officially got my feet wet with my street promo, hustle, networking with different individuals, and uh, really gung-ho with it in 97. Had a couple of different people that really influenced me. And then come 98, the following year, I ended up doing my own first show. So I'm hitting my 15-year anniversary this year uh, with producing my own events. And then uh, from there, fast forward to 2000, a couple years later, I end up doing my own big shows in Orlando and end up doing some, some very special events. Uh, there was a big rave, massive, in fact, called Cyberfest that happened over on the East Coast that originated from California. They ended up doing the East Coast version of it in uh, Melbourne, Palm Bay area, and I ended up getting the rights to do the official after party for it. And I had a variety of talent on there, majority breakbeat and different electronic sounds. That ended up getting me some publicity, if you will. And then from there, I ended up the following year, 2001, when my Saturday Night Successful Saturday popped off at Firestone. And Firestone. Uh, from there... Yes, sir. Firestone, indeed. I think you might be familiar with that, Vernon. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah. Um, and then from 2001, ended up doing my Firestone night for a couple of years there. And then that moved into Miami and working with Ultra Festival. And we can maybe tap into that later. But I've done a stage for Ultra for many years. Um in the mid 2000s, and then that's when the FSOB brand popped off officially in 2002, 2003. Okay, and what role did Orlando play in all that? I know I, know I heard you mention Orlando earlier, and that, and part of going through the history of, you know, how you got started and 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 how you you knew, you came into the industry. How did Orlando play in, in, in my role? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, what's the significance of Orlando in all of that? You know, because that's where we're here now, um, you know, and, and that's where, you know, I think Orlando, you know, from what I understand, played a significant role in the whole um, breaks movement and, and, and really just dance music in general um, in, the, in the United States on the East Coast. So I was just trying to see how, you know, how that tied into how Orlando played. What role did Orlando play in, in, in you coming up in the industry, essentially? Thank you. All right. Yeah, no, great. I'm, I'm actually glad you elaborated on that a little bit because that actually got me in the zone of what we're talking about here because you, you bring up a very, a very valid point that I happen to live in Orlando and I happen to get my start in the rave scene in Orlando, like I said, in the mid-90s. Well, at the time, we didn't know how, the, how influential Orlando was at the time because it just it was what it was you know it's funny now that you know come full circle come here we are now 2013 and this we're talking 20 years ago where even before i started going out 
you know, the people that I, that were my mentors, the ones that, that paved the way for us, that, that inspired me, people like DJ Icy, first and foremost, shout out to the Iceman, the, that's the Don of Orlando as far as I'm concerned. Then you've got Kimball Collins, who's the original boss, doing Oz with Dave Canalti, Chris Fortier, the list is endless. There is a lot of major players that have come out of Orlando that really helped pave the way for the United States in terms of electronic dance music. Now, mind you, here we are 20 years later, and this quote, EDM, electronic dance music, for those that don't know what that acronym is, EDM is the biggest thing, you know, since sliced bread right now, it's the big, it's the hottest thing in the market. But then it was such an underground thing that a lot of markets around the States weren't really in the know yet. I mean, of course, Los Angeles, shout outs to Insomniac, the Squawratella, all those guys, they were way ahead of the curve. People in New York, like Stuck on Earth, uh, Chris Love and Jeff, those guys were doing it big with the big boo masses and, on Randall's Island in New York City. The big markets had rave scenes. But in terms of in the United States, one of the only smaller markets, even though Orlando is bigger now, one of the smaller markets at the time being Orlando and kind of being more of a hometown kind of city, for it to be as influential as it is now, 20 years later, we're able to talk about how Orlando was like the epicenter of electronic music slash what turned into being known as Orlando Breaks and that the break beat is so big from here. It's ironic that my work and my brand happens to have the word breaks in it. And I happen to be a break beat slash broken beat event producer, but I just happen to be from here and I happen to love it here. And I've traveled, like I said, I've went to different uh, towns and went to different colleges and I've moved to Los Angeles back, but something has always brought me back to Orlando. And so it, it's surreal to me that I'm working in this industry that I started, quote, partying in back in my, in my, uh, my young adulthood. I ended up going out to these raves in 94, going to Cosmos One, which was produced by Mars at the Orange County Convention Center which then led to hyperspace in early 95, which was at the Central Florida Fairgrounds off Colonial Drive, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That, uh, those big raves, Cosmos and hyperspace in particular, were the two jump-offs that made me go, wow. I originally had complete interest in being doing acting, being an actor, and I was going to follow that role when I was in high school, and I used to do a lot of acting. And, and uh, long story short, I went to a couple of these parties, I was like, wow, what is this music? What is this scene? This is the coolest thing. And I always always loved dancing, too, when I was younger. Never really as a career, I just always loved to dance. And I went to the party and just couldn't believe the way that the music moved me. And, uh, uh, you know, mind, body, and soul. So, in a nutshell, went to these big parties in the mid-90s and uh, literally changed my life from there. I mean, that, that, that made me be completely dedicated to this industry. I don't know what exactly it was specifically, and it was just something I just found myself constantly motivated, constantly wanting to promote, something I need to throw out there to actually to, inspiring, to inspire people who are aspiring to do promotional work is you can't do this overnight. You can, and you also can't get, expect to get paid right away. So the people that expect to make a quick buck or, or, or try to get quick fix in this industry, you can't do that. I, I grinded on the streets for easily three years, from 97 to 2000. I did free work for everyone I worked with, 100% to boxes, thousands of thousands of flyers, and did promotional work for people, completely on the strength of knowing that it would be an asset overall for me in the long term with my career because me and my networking and the network that I would build for me showing that my heart was invested in the right way, mm -hmm. that would overall end up turning me in to not only doing my work better in the long term, but also people entrusting in me that my heart is in the right place. So I went off on a major tangent from no, the I'm, end of I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because later on I was gonna ask you, you know, what advice you have for, you know, young entrepreneurs that are looking to you know, make this a career move. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you covered that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's important that they know, you know, you can't, there happens to be these select, you know, within a minimal amount of people that are in this industry that become successful overnight, largely event. I mean, excuse me, largely music producers 
and certain artists that just happen to get that break because they happen to make a catchy song or whatnot. But when it comes to throwing events or being an event producer or making a name for yourself as someone that is that has their integrity intact and everything else, you need to you need to prove yourself and prove that your heart's in the right place and and not expect to get to get overall handouts on the quick tip or you're never going to go anywhere. Frankly, in my opinion. Major respect to that. Uh, I, I appreciate you saying that because, I, I mean, I see, I mean, in, in Indian industry, I think, um, you know, a lot of people, I think it's just the American way to just kind of go after the, the dollar sign. But, of course. Um, you know, when you have passion behind your work, people people definitely recognize that. Um, you know, I, I definitely see that in, in what you do, you know, being at the level in, of success you are in your career and still going to flyer parking lots, you know, like, a lot of guys probably probably wouldn't do that at this point in their career, and you still do that, which which I think is great. Now I wanted to ask, um, you know, you've you've been doing this for you know a long time now, and you know a lot has changed in terms of you know dance music, you know, coming on the forefront and being somewhat of a commodity now, and 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 uh, you know it's it's really hot, it's it's really trendy. What are what are some of the things that you've seen? changed um in the game since since you've since you've um come in over over the last few years um well when you say last few years you're spot on there has been definitely a change in the guard as far as the industry goes uh things from from yesteryears versus now in the last few years way different um in a lot of ways good in in some ways bad um i do overall think it's great for the industry I'm glad to see the music and the scene and the dance element of things. I'm glad to see getting the publicity in the mainstream eye. I'm glad to see you get that publicity and get that exposure. It's a great thing. Uh, in the same regard, when things do go mainstream and they go, quote, pop, as we know, just like you and I both being people that I mean knowing you pretty well and knowing that your love for hip hop music and everything else, just like myself, that's right. that I also, that's also, yes, sir, that's also definitely influenced me. That, that's influenced me in terms of me. Like I said, I used to be a dancer and so, uh, and I still am, but I'm older now, so, and I'm always busy with my work. But overall, um, the music and everything has overall, um, how do I put this? Uh, just like with hip hop. When, when things go, and, and no disrespect to the music industry or to hip-hop artists or whatnot, and, I'm, and I am getting ultimately, there is a point to this, that as far as, the, as far as hip-hop goes, it's just a prime example, that hip-hop from the 90s, as you and I both know, is amazing music. There is a lot of amazing music there. Now, mind you, there's some good artists that are out there now that make some great music, too. Hit or miss. But frankly, when the hip-hop scene which went mainstream and pop before. Basically the same thing happened. Once thing goes, something goes pop and something goes mainstream, it just tends to kind of water it down, I guess you could say, is the best way to describe it. And I think that it, the mainstream media has made somewhat of a mockery of the electronic industry. I, I think that it's, it's taken away. I don't want to use the whole cliche of underground because things can't stay underground forever. So whenever I hear people, you know, bitching and moaning, and excuse my French about, you know, oh, it's not underground anymore. Well, it can't stay underground forever because eventually people are going to catch on and it's going to continue to become, you know, so it is kind of a catch 22. But when things do become so mainstream, Every Tom, Dick, and Harry wants to be a part of it, and it becomes where, like, everybody's an overnight sensation, everybody's a big DJ, everybody's even an event promoter these days, where back in the day, there was only a select few of us that were really throwing shows, and there were still a ton of DJs, but now it's becoming a point where it is just completely, the market is just completely flooded with talent. Now, mind you, there is, in the electronic world anyway, I wouldn't, don't really say the same for hip-hop, unfortunately. It's very hit or miss there these days. But <laughs> with electronic music, there are a lot of fresh artists that have great artist profiles. They've got great managers. They have great designers doing, you know, their marketing and publicity is on fire. I will say that the industry has definitely stepped up their game in that regard. And I'm a huge marketing design head. So, like, when it comes to that, I'm very particular about design, very particular about marketing. 
Your image is everything, and I think that artists are definitely recognizing that and stepping their game up these days. Uh, but as far as the way that events are being done and this and that, um, I, I think that there is a somewhat knowledge out there, but I also think there's a lot of overnight promoters and whatnot that are doing shows and don't really have a knowledge or history of the scene from back in the day that I really think a lot of them need to be a little bit more cultured on. And I think they'd have a little bit more understanding of where we come from with this. Well, I, I think I get what you're saying. Like it's, you, you have to have kind of a balance. You can't really, you know, if, 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 if everything's, I, I guess looking back, I guess the, the best example I can use, cause you know, I've been a DJ longer than I have a promoter. I'm um, going on almost uh, 10 years now. And um, when, when I started DJing, we'd go to the record stores and we'd dig for records and, you know, we'd, we'd have that. It took time, you know, you had to, it was, there was an education process and, and that, that wasn't something that you could kind of like force yourself. Like it wasn't like a microwave McDonald's sandwich, like that you can just, it was a one and done or, or get done really quick. There is an education process. And I think what I've seen now, um, cause I kind of straddle the line um, and being a, a DJ and a promoter is that a lot of people want it now and they don't want to put the work in kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, do this for a couple of years and do it, you know, put your heart into it, put your passion in, and, and don't expect to get a paycheck, you know, show that you have value, show, build your brand, build your name. And I, I think that in, in uh, my generation and in, in the one closely behind me is that we, we kind of have this, you know, um, this short, short, get it done, one and done microwave McDonald's franchise mentality where it's like, we want it now, but we want it fast. And, and there's really, um, a lack of education or, you know, there's, there's not really a lot of time. There's, there's not being a lot of time taken into you know, actually studying your craft and honing your skills. So that's that's where I think um, we've kind of gotten lost a little bit. But I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, with with technology and, you know, and advances and, and the and their, the kids are way smarter um, now with with the way they can use technology, that that will um, ultimately be the thing that connects people. And like like, you know, take, for example, this interview, you know, somebody who um, is a promoter now that's maybe younger that wasn't a part of that scene, um, you know, that you saw or that you grew up in, they're being educated by us on this interview alone. And, and that's what kind of is my hope is that people will dig a little bit deeper below the surface. So, um, sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there. <laughs> oh, I don't mind at all. I don't mind. I, I, I ultimately want to hear your feedback as well. And also, I don't, I, I don't want to you know, consistently talk about me or at the same token, I also don't want to sit here and seem like I'm being like, oh, I'm that old school promoter who is is jaded by any means or any capacity like that at all because, frankly, I don't feel that way at all. In fact, I feel I'm, in terms of who I come across, I'm, I am one of the more positive people that you will come across and very optimistic and very driven and looking forward to seeing where this industry goes so by no means do i want to sound as if i'm you know uh, not pleased with the promoters these days or the artists or anything else like that but i am uh, by nature and people know me uh for those that don't know me they're getting introduced to me today and hi everybody uh but ultimately i am a very blunt straight shooter and i will say how i feel and i and like you said what's the good things and the bad things about what I've seen about the scene with these days, and uh, frankly, I, I have mixed emotions. You know, I have a lot of things that I like, and I have, a, and I have some things that I don't. Mm -hmm. But I overall try to embrace the good, and at the same token, to be completely honest, I focus on my own career. I focus on what I'm doing, and of course, I like to keep tabs on what others are doing. But at the same token, and I'm, uh, and and on a side note, I'm inspired by what some others are doing. Some people are taking these things to really major heights with you know, multi-million, million dollar productions and this and that that are pretty impressive to see these things come to life. Um, so I am inspired in a lot of regards, but I overall just try to focus on what I'm doing in my career and my team and continue to just strive to try to be better at what I do year after year and 
you know, overall just leave a legacy for myself and for the Future Sound of Breaks organization. Respect, respect, man. Um, Thanks. Tell me, tell me about DJs now. Uh, do you have any advice? I know you do a lot of, uh, like the massive in Miami, there's over like a hundred DJs or something crazy like that, um, <laughs> that you put together. Um, yeah, this year, this year was like 110. I think we had, yeah. Was there any advice that you'd have for DJs, like trying to reach out for promoters for like bigger, these bigger events and festivals? Uh, what type of are you saying? What type of advice would I give them to be able to get on the bill? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like I mean, even from like um, something like, uh, for example, like a DJ names. Like if something even coming down to that, not like suggesting a DJ name, but like I know that you're a huge, huge advocate of being on brand and like making sure like everything's on point and it's clean and it looks professional. Like even in that regard, um, you know. Any advice to like DJs out there um, that are, you know, uh, for example, if somebody reached out to you to play the the massive in Miami, you know, like um, uh, how would that scenario go, or or what would advice would you have for for younger up and coming DJs? I guess something like that. Uh, of course, every situation is different. Um, excuse me. Um, every situation is different. And everybody that reaches out to me, of course, is different. And everybody's in their own category and whatnot. And regardless of me, you know, in terms of the industry, different promoters are different. And so everybody has their own way of kind of the way that they determine who they're going to work with or who they're not going to work with. Uh, I will tell you that first and foremost, I am big on professionalism. I'm big on being treated with respect, not because I feel like I deserve respect from like what I've accomplished in the industry. That's I don't want people to get it twisted. That's not where I'm going with that. I I deserve to be communicated with properly just because I put the same effort when it comes to me communicating with people. So Correct. a lot of it has to do with the with the uh, with the introduction of sorts. If someone writes me and they write me with as much as of course if I'm talking to friends course i speak a little bit more casual and this and that definitely if, if someone writes me with a yo 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 thing and they never met me before then that's immediately a no-no okay <laughs> so that, that's just extremely unprofessional now mind you i'll talk that way maybe with some friends of mine but that's a different story because we're on a different level if right. you're contacting me about business in any accord then i expect you to speak to me in a professional manner just like if i wrote someone i would write them in a professional sense so that is maybe one of my pet peeves, just, just to kind of vent to you or talk to you about since you're asking me. Um, in terms of me overall and like in terms of them and more as an artist, not really in terms of the approach or the way that they talk to me or whatnot, if, if someone contacts me, uh, a lot of it has to do with their DJ name. I will be honest. It's not because it's like a, a popularity thing or like, oh, you know, it's, it's DJ so-and-so, so automatically I'm going to book them because a lot of people know them. That's not really what I mean. I'm more particular in terms of the – not to use the term, you know, because it's played out in 2013. But if there isn't a, some type of swagger to someone's DJ name – and if it's something that just isn't flattering, and I'm not going to put any names on blast right now because, of course, there's a variety that I could think of. But without throwing any specific names out there, if it's not going to be flattering to my overall production, and if someone's going to read it and do a double take and go, ooh, what is – that's a weird name. I don't even want people to do that. So I try to avoid that at all costs. So the DJ name itself, I'm very particular on. So that's important, of course. The communication factor – and the way that I communicate with them, of course, is a big factor. If they're willing to do promotional work, not for free per se, but a, a barter system of sorts where you know they, they will ultimately get a good slot and they'll get great exposure. And all modesty aside, the Massive in Miami is one of the premier events down there, certainly in the broken beat, uh, breakbeat slash bass music world of things. Uh, it's one of the premier events. And so if someone wants to be on it, it's most definitely great exposure for them. So... A lot of times I'll have someone reach out to me with different expectations and we just don't see eye to eye. And so unfortunately it's not able to work out, you know, no hard feelings type of thing. But a lot of that comes into just a daily grind of me consistently communicating and networking, interacting with different people each year. And then I kind of just narrow it down, determining on what names I think are the best ones to be on the bill, which ones complement each other well. Oh, so-and-so is affiliated or associated with so-and-so. 
And then it ultimately ends up making it that much more creative because each room will have different artists that kind of tie into the others and it kind of brings this overall theme to each arena. And we have five arenas at the at the event. Each room kind of is a different genre slash subgenre of sorts. Uh, the main room is a full smorgasbord of multi genres. Uh, the other rooms, like we'll have more for the for the younger generation. We'll have the dubstep slash trap. We'll have a drum and bass room with the jungle, the old school jungle splashed in. Then we'll have a Miami electro room, which a lot of these newer cats call electro. This house. I'm talking about a Miami Electro bass, which is the original 808 Electro. So that's something that the kids need to know. Electro is old school Electro, which is Miami bass, gangsta bass, FYI. And then (laughs) we do traditional breakbeat, but each room has to have a theme and an overall flow in terms of the different artists that are involved. So that kind of helps with my determination and decision making with myself and my other partners that are involved as well. And this is, I mean, this is an event that, you know, you put on by your, uh, I mean, you're an independent promoter, obviously, like you're not one of, you're not, um, I mean, in terms of, of you've been doing this for a very long time and as an independent promoter, like how does someone pull that off? Like, it seems like it's very discouraging sometimes, um, seeing like bigger players come into the market. But I think, uh, seeing someone like you as an independent promoter, have been doing this for 10 plus years it gives us confidence, uh, like like a younger guy that's probably coming up um, in the scene that may not, you know, have a lot of backing in terms of capital, to see that you put something on, uh, you know, like this, and you've done it for so long by yourself. Um, what? How, how does? How do you pull that off, man? <laughs> I mean, it seems a little. Uh, well, I will tell you first and foremost, I'm I'm very flattered. Thank you for for the props. I appreciate. Um, it, it's been baby steps. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, from the beginning, um, just to kind of give a little, a little overview, I talked about my earlier years in the nineties, moving into 2000, did my Firestone night, 2001 to 2002 ish. And then from there was kind of my own changing of the guard. And that's when I got hired with the ultra music festival and my partner, uh, and myself, who happened to be Ray Navarro, who passed away last year. Uh, respect to Ray Navarro and the whole Global HTM family. Um, he's the one that gave me the opportunity to, to produce the first major breakbeat slash Miami Electro stage at the Ultra Festival. We did the Miami Electro bass slash breakbeat stage with Ultra 2002 to 2006. And then simultaneously, I launched the Future Sign of Breaks brand at the same time because I knew Ultra was a major window for me to be able to make more of a name for myself. So I ended up catapulting my career of sorts by creating the Future Sign of Breaks brand, aka FSOB. We had the brand start when I did my Ultra stuff. Then I created my own show in Miami. Well, getting back to what you asked about how I put the lineup and all that together, part of it had to do with my work with Ultra. And that definitely was an asset to me in terms of gave me some leverage with artists and people because not only they saw that I grinded really hard and I was on the streets and I networked and like you said, do flyering and whatnot, which I still do to this day. You know, I, I really feel that you need to put that that extra grind in to not only to prove to people that, you know, I'm a hard worker, but it's just hard work pays off. And if I go out there and I do my grind myself in, along with my team, instead of just expecting people to do it for me, then I know that that little extra mile is going to, at least in my brain, it's going to make things better in, in the long haul because I feel like I put my all into it. Well, getting back to Ultra, I would be out networking and socializing with the artists and I was very hands-on with my approach with the stage. It wasn't like I was just behind the scenes. I booked the talent. And then just watch everything come to life and then not speak with the fans or talk with the people. And the fans and the people, a lot of them are the artists too. You know, this is all, everybody's all a melting pot of fans, artists, event producers, managers, etc. Well, the more that they see you networking, the more they see you socializing with people and being down to earth and treating people with that mutual respect that we touched on, people saw that not only that I had my heart in the right place, but they also saw that I had the access to be able to give them the ability to perform on an event like the Magnitude of Ultra Festival, which we know now is, you know, sells out like in a matter of weeks or whatever they do now. I'm not really, you know, in the know as of present day what they really got going on. But back in the day, 
it was it was still building its brand and, and becoming bigger, but it was already big. I mean, it came on the scene, and within a matter of a couple of years, it became a juggernaut. And so by the time I was doing the stage, it was already a massive festival. So that gave me leverage to be able to communicate with different artists and then see, okay, you know, regardless of their take on me personally, they realize that I inside connect to be able to put them on the lineup of course ultra was a little bit more complicated because it was only x amount of uh, slots per day and the festival was only one day at that time so they would only have on my stage for that one day we would only have about 10 12 slots so only the the, the creme de la creme the cream of the crop would make those slots whereas fsob on the other hand to, to kind of get back to where we started with this fsob uh, Future Sound of Breaks at the time it re wasn't really known as FSOB initially. Everybody called it FSOB because it was easier to call it that. But it was originally Future Sound of Breaks. When I did that Future Sound of Breaks one uh, in two thousand three, that was uh, approximately fifteen to twenty DJs, um, strictly breakbeat and Miami electro, and it was a lot of my peers slash friends slash artists that I looked up to at the time. And uh, we had one room. The air conditioning broke that night. So we're in a hot box, one room hot box with like 250, 300 people. At, at the time, there really wasn't even a big breakbeat event during Winter Music Conference. So we kind of needed to fill that niche with whatever you, whatever you want to call it in the industry. And uh, we, we did this little party in this one room, had these 20 DJs play. And then fast forward to now, we went from 300 people to 3,000 people Jeez. and went from 20 DJs to over 100 DJs and one room to five rooms at the Mega Nightclub in downtown Miami called Mecca. Shout outs to Mecca. We appreciate you guys, what the up? management. Yes, sir. So um, in a nutshell, as far as the uh, talent goes and everything else, how have I been able to acquire the amount of people we do and everything else? Like I said, baby steps. We go from Ultra, and I go from the, sh the event with the 20 DJs, and then I just continue to network and meet different people, and we continue to establish the brand, and then FSOB became more of a household name. We started becoming pretty much known officially as FSOB, even though we'll always be known as Future Sound of Breaks as the foundation company. FSOB is the acronym slash lingo, whatever you want to call it, for people on the streets. Yeah, you go into FSOB this Friday during Miami, during conference, blah, 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 right after Ultra. And uh, word just spread like wildfire. And so all the DJs know that if they play bass music, that this is a hot ticket to get on. And um, it's pretty much panned out like that, man. That's cool. So it sounds, so it sounds like, like there was a lot of, um, you know, networking, you know, networking involved. involved. It wasn't just it was something that you you did overnight. You know, it took it took time kind of going back to, you know, what you were saying earlier in terms of giving people advice. You know, it, it was something that gradually happened over time. You put in the work, you network with the artists. There was, and, and that hard, working hard and networking put you in the position to be able to have certain opportunities and then having those relationships. You know, you, you worked hard, you, you kept putting in work and then you built off of that year after year and now it's this huge 3,000 person mega event, mega massive in Miami. So that's, that's cool to hear that story and it's, it's very inspiring for me personally. Um, I don't know how anyone else feels out there about that. May maybe somebody else will be inspired. Hopefully, they'll be inspired um, from that story. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ron. Thank you very much. It's 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 been a it's been a wild, crazy road going down that. I, I mean, I, I will tell you that. You know, e each year there's different curveballs that get thrown our way. Lots of different events and different people that do different stuff, and there's a lot of politics that go in, that get involved in it. And like you said, I'm, we're an independent company. Um, we don't, you know, there, we, of course we have sponsors, you know, uh, majority of the years we've had monster energy has been involved with us. Shout out to monster energy. They've always been the monster drink. They've always been a, a part of our, a part of our team. And my, uh, my direct partners being culture productions out of Miami, shout out to culture and sound records. Uh, my original partner, um, angel and Brant are my two official partners on the show, as well as Hugo, the four of us produce the event along with my right hand man, uh, AKA partner in crime, Matt. Um, basically, the five of us are the executives that produce the event together. But overall, yes, we do it. We do it independently. And for us to do the amount of numbers like we do, it really, really boils down to the strength of the relationships that I've built, not just with artists, but with agents over the years and people that have faith in us 
that know that not even just that it's a quote hot ticket to get on, but that they know that the that we are going to go the extra mile and make sure the production angles are right, make sure the publicity and the marketing is done properly for their artists, make sure that the logos and everything else and the design angles of things need to be spot on. And that is something that I will always do to the day I die. Right on, man. Tell me, tell me about the. So we've talked a little bit about um, the the scene as a whole, kind of where it's. Um, where 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 it originated, you know, um, and you growing up and, and being a part of that and influencing that to present day, uh, where do, where do you see uh, things going, or where where would you hope to see um, dance music, EDM, whatever you um, you know, whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it, if you want to phrase it as EDM, what what would you like to see happen over the say, let's say the next decade? within dance music what are some of the key um th issues that you think will need to be addressed and and how do we and how do we as as uh, the next generation solve those problems and and um you know create more opportunity while still keeping integrity intact i know that's well, a loaded question <laughs> sorry uh, no it's fine it's fine this is stuff this is stuff that's actually really important to me and i and i think about it quite often actually um it's just uh want to make sure i i say ultimately how i truly feel on this uh, i will say uh, kind of starting out in terms of the points that you made in terms of the where do i see electronic going AKA EDM, where do I see this EDM massive movement that's occurring? Where do I see this going? Uh, well, I will say that with people, prime example, definitely the number one name that pops into mind and I have to give respect where it's due, is Skrillex being the person who has really opened the floodgates in the last few years, especially the last probably two years in particular, that he has opened the floodgates with the not just making this stuff mainstream and giving it opportunities that, you know, but and not to, to put it solely on his shoulders, but he definitely is kind of the poster boy for I someone agree. who who got the attention of the music awards and, and MTV and these 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 organizations that have always shown electronic music or quote dance music at the time. They always show dance music a certain level of respect. As you, I'm sure, are familiar, and a lot of people out there are familiar with MTV2 and whatnot, they've always, or like MTV Europe or whatever. These MTV2 in America or MTV Europe or whatever they call it over there, these guys have always, they've always shown respect to these electronic artists. But in terms of the, quote, mainstream media, I, you know, of course, hip hop, and, and which blew up, you know, in the course of the last 10, 15 years, whatever, that had its its moment where that peaked and went mainstream. That's kind of what's all, it's kind of like happening over again, but with EDM instead, mm -hmm. that it's becoming this pop thing, kind of like I touched on before. Well, the mainstream media didn't, didn't really show the full respect for electronic back when it was already blown up, but didn't, they just, I don't think, I mean, I think some people that work for those organizations knew that it was there, but I don't think that they really gave it the appreciation that it really deserved. And when people, and just using him as an example, Skrillex came on the scene and he had, you know, eight or nine in the top 10 on Beatport, eight or nine songs that all blew up and went right there with his first album. And that skyrocketed him in, in the industry and then opened up the eyes of, of people with the, with the music awards and whatnot. They saw this and are like, Oh my God, this is the next big thing. And the next thing you know, there's people like, um, not really my cup of tea to be completely frank, but people, not Skrillex, but I, I like some of his stuff, but you know, people like Afro Jack and, and Steve Aoki, you know, and all that other nonsense and throwing cakes and stuff like, you know, I don't endorse none of that. You know, that is not my cup of tea at all. You know, FSOB stands for integrity and we stand for real flavor, good music good event production, standing on the strength of real vibes, not putting on some type of stunts, like this is some type of movie scene or something, like we're not doing that. Like we stand for real deal f music with flavor to it and, and on the strength on our backs when it comes to integrity. And so I'm, I do tend to go off on tangents at times, but you know, that, that was kind of a loaded question you gave me. I, I, I see it continuing to soar in terms of new heights with the music, 
Mm -hmm. And these festivals, you know, this 2013 is definitely the year of the festival. There is, there is a festival, it seems like, even in America, it seems like there's a festival every week. You know, every weekend there's a festival, like, you know, in places, the most random places, like, no disrespect, but like Alabama and like, you know, Arkansas and like all these kind of like different types of festivals in states that didn't even have an electronic scene 10, 15 years ago, really, or if it did, it was very minimal because I've followed the scene very closely, you know, pretty much since the inception of my career. And uh, it, it's just, it's mind boggling to see how things have become so mainstream and that festivals are so big now and that it, it, it's, it's like, it's the pastime now. Like everybody wants to go to the festival. Like, hey, you going to this festival this weekend? Like it's, it's the in thing. So it's really cool to see. It's opening up doors and opening up windows for artists and, and event promoters like myself to be able to have different opportunities to work with different people and whatnot. So, you know, I mean, overall, it's a great thing. So those that are hearing my tone and hearing me talk, it's by no means me being, you know, hypercritical. It's just, I keep it real. I'm blunt about what I think about this stuff. And like I said, I have mixed emotions, so I'm happy to see it all blowing up because it's only giving new opportunities for everybody, myself included. Uh, but at the same token, you know, um, I, I, I'm happy to see it continuing to be moving forward like it is. Um, but you know, there there is different sides to, of the coin. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It sounds like, it sounds like I mean, every, every the, there's, there's with the doors opening, it's allowing more promoters opportunity. Um, you know, people that have been in the game, you know, for a long time, you know, guys like yourself, Pasqual, um, you know, uh, on the West Coast, also um, uh, Destructo, uh, Gary Richards, people like that. It's it's offering them more opportunity to be able to do bigger things. But at, at the same time, I think, um, you know, there's some challenges that 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 we have to, um, you know, address in terms of. You know, don't not like, for example, not not straying too far from from what you started this and, and why you believed in it, which I think um, is something that the FSOB brand has been able to to really do. I mean, uh, to be able to to still uh, throw parties where, you know, I've, I've been to parties at Firestone here recently where you guys have, you know, 2000 people wall to wall. And these are people who have been in the scene for a very long time. These aren't um, new jacks. Um, as, as, <laughs> as if you want to put it, um, yeah. but th there are, there is challenges and, and I think it's important to address those challenges, you know, with anything with growth, there's growing pains and, um, you know, in, in terms of people just hopping in, you know, um, or money pouring in, um, without the, uh, the right people involved, um, uh, or the people behind it, and if if their if their uh, motivation is is only to make money, and and they're not really concerned about the repercussions of of doing these bigger events, or you know, or, or festivals happening every week, or or even the smaller independent promoters. I mean, uh, in my opinion, they're the ones that are in the in the trenches every week, doing weeklies of events, doing parties. I mean, they're the ones who are keeping the scene alive, and if you know, those guys aren't there, then, you know, the scene doesn't exist on a local level. Um, and, and, and that's just my two cents on that. No, I, I totally appreciate it. Uh, just so people are aware out there, you, you, you touched on, on Gary and, uh, Destructo that that's the, the man who ultimately runs hard. Hello? Just so people heard me correctly out there. I said, holy ship as in the boat, um, it, it, in case my mom's listening, hey mom, how are you, <laughs> love you. Um, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, yes, like guys like that are doing some really big things, like for example, taking a cruise line the size like he does, the size of a boat on a major cruise boat and taking it out there in, in, the, in, the, in international waters for multiple days and being one big mega rave with all the biggest EDM, quote, EDM superstars on it, uh, you know, and going and being on some deserted island and everything else. I mean, it's it's really next level stuff. It's stuff that people were not doing, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. So it is really neat to see the opportunities and the doors that have opened with this EDM uh, explosion in the scene, uh, most especially in America. I know there is some international people that don't particularly care for the way that U.S. is kind of 
flamboyantly taken this electronic music and gone so mainstream with it. But there are a lot of people that are doing some really next level stuff, like the gentleman that you mentioned. So, you know, I do appreciate those moves and I do appreciate seeing those things happen, I- including myself. I like to be able to aspire to, con- you know, to continue to do that stuff inspires me to want to do, you know, crazy uh, off the wall cool productions like that. I mean, it's a cool, it's a cool look. Um, in the same token, you kind of touched on me and the FSOB brand and what we stand for and everything. I will tell you that, um, not to really give my tricks of the trade away, but to kind of give a little insight as to where my brain is with FSOB on a day to day basis and where I stand with this. And a lot of people will know this for the people that follow me on Facebook and whatnot, um, or the social media, uh, websites and whatnot. My overall stance on where I stand with this to kind of make myself and my company and my team stand out from the rest, not to imply that we're on our own whatever, you know, level or whatever, because there are a lot of people doing similar things or that stand for similar for similar properties or if you will in this industry. But I will tell you that I will never lose sight of the old school community. I will never lose sight of the older genres that paved the way for this scene. So I think that not to take a you-know-what on the people that are doing events these days, but majority of them are focused on, okay, what's the trend right now in 2013? Let me just book strictly trendy bookings all the time. That's fine and all if all you're wanting to do is try to make money. But if you want people to truly respect you, and this is not a jab at anyone in particular, so whoever's listening to this, do not think that I'm saying this to anybody one specific. What I'm saying right now is that you cannot lose sight of the foundation of the industry that paved the way for what you are doing today and putting money in your pocket today, okay? Myself included. Miami, prime example. We do all kinds of new base bookings. You know, we do Mode Step, Dat Sick, Zomboy, Excision, Borgor. You know, the list is endless. We've done all these big new bass music players, but there is not one single person that can come and say to me, you know, oh, he, well, I mean, of course, or I've heard some people say it, but, you know, the facts of the facts that nobody can say that FSOB has turned their back on the foundation of where they originally came from. We still have all the original Dons like DJ Icy. Crafty Cuts, you know, Stanton Warriors, people like that. And then on the Electro Miami, original Miami Electro Sound, like the Dynamics 2s and the uh, the Hydraulics and the people like that. We have the guys that have been doing stuff for years, for 10 years plus, maybe even 20 years. We will continue to have those guys depending on where their career is and if they're relevant and whatnot. Because, of course, that a lot of that plays into, into account with how we, we set these lineups up and whatnot. But when it comes to my brand and where I stand on the strength of Future Sound of Breaks, FSOB, is I will continue to move forward and evolve with this industry. But I will never lose sight of the foundation of where we come from and the artists that help pave the way, not just for my career, but for this industry as a whole. And I think that not many promoters these days – really still pay homage and respect to those artists. There are some promoters that do, so please don't get it twisted out there that I, I want people to understand that I do overall love what people are doing in this industry. At the same token, though, I think that there are some that have lost sight of where this stuff all originally comes from. And so that is a very vital part as far as my organization, where we stand, and when it really boils down to what I would say is the one-word mission statement for FSOB, which is integrity. And I will never lose sight of that. Right on, man. Oh, man. Well, I um, I appreciate you you coming on and, and sharing your thoughts. I think there's going to be a lot that we can take away from this. Um, is there any final thoughts, you know, or anything that uh, maybe we didn't cover that you want to touch on? Um, any shout outs? Uh, also, um, before that, actually, before we get into that, while we're on the subject of the uh, Future Sound of Breaks brand and, and, and FSOB, is there anything coming up that we can expect in the future? Um, any shows that you're looking forward to in particular? Okay. Um, final thoughts. Uh, well, we know that I can I can talk the uh, <laughs> I, I I can talk the you know what off of you know what you know. So I ultimately you know I I'm not going to go off in any more of my tangents, but. I, I will tell you that it has been a pleasure talking with you tonight, Vernon. I do appreciate it. Um, it. It hopefully this is able to give some of the newer generation some insight 
as to where episode B stands. I hope people take my words constructively and understand that my heart is in the right place with this and that I am ultimately a blunt person and I love to share my thoughts with people. Either they love it or they hate it, you know. Um, at the same token, I know where I stand on this. And uh, my parents raised me well. And mom and dad, I love you out there. Thank you so much. My parents actually are in Alaska right now. Um, they're on a cruise. Uh, I would be with them right now, but I'm busy handling work, business and whatnot. So um, that will go to show you my dedication because I should be on a cruise boat in Juneau, Alaska right now. Um, nice. But uh, shout out to mom and dad. Love you guys. And uh, shout out to all my friends, my family, my team. I got a huge team out there. Everybody represents me. Florida, we're holding it down in the, in the Sunshine State. Florida base. That's how we represent. Um, and uh, lastly, what I'd like to touch on there, I have a, a, a tour concept for FSOB. I've done some touring over the years, uh, on and off in the last five, seven years. I've, I've done some different touring. We've been to about 30, 40 markets around uh, the United States and Canada um, over the years. And I've had a little hiatus as of recently and kind of focused on my work here locally, but planning on doing some, some more tour work here in the near future. So I've got that whole concept in the works. But um, I will say that my, excuse me, I will say that my main focus right now, um, other than, of course, in early 2014 being the Future Sound of Breaks Massive, that people can expect in Miami once again, our annual show that we were touching on earlier. That'll be with over 100 artists. That'll be in March 2014 at the Winter Music Conference. That'll be the 12th anniversary of FSOB. So they can expect the biggest and baddest lineup yet. They can quote me on that. Um, and in the meanwhile, for the fall season, we have our annual, another brand, a sub-brand that I've created with some partners of mine, which is called The Reunion. And that is going to be paying homage to the original scene that we've talked about a lot tonight. So kind of everything's kind of coming full circle right now. We're going to be paying respect to the original forefathers, uh, founding fathers, if you will, from the Florida scene. Uh, special guest being Dub Tribe Sound System. I want my planet back. They are uh, uh, key players in the early 90s scene, even before I came into the mix of things. They were headliners at some legendary clubs like Simon's in Gainesville and Firestone, which was named, which was called the club at Firestone at the time. And uh, Dub Tribe is going to be our very special guest for the evening. We also have DJIC doing an exclusive old school set. Uh, first time in a very long time in Orlando doing a special old school set. So that's something very special that people are going to look forward to, I know for sure. And um, we also have Dave Christopher, the brainchild of Rabbit in the Moon. He's going to be performing an all-classic set uh, as a tribute to Scott Hardkiss of the Har Hardkiss Brothers, Delusions of Grandeur. Rest in peace to Scott. Rest in peace. Uh, respect to his family. And uh, we have a variety of other players that are on the bill. Um, all the Orlando original bosses like Robbie, Stylus, uh, Andy Hughes, Sandy, AK-1200, Security, Eric Beretta, Cliff Tangeretti. I mean, the list, the list goes on and on. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's going to be uh, Labor Day weekend at the none other than Firestone Live on Saturday, August 31st. August and, 31st. Um, yes, sir. So we're, we're really excited about that. We're going to be we're going to be making we're going to be making history on that night. So everybody make, better make sure that they make it to Firestone on Labor Day weekend because it's going to pop off proper. Well, well, just to recap, I mean, we because we, we talked a about a lot here. I mean, uh, you, you told us about, you know, you, you took us back kind of through a, a timeline of how you got started in the business. Um, you know, uh, you go back to Tallahassee, to Gainesville, to Orlando, and the significance that the Orlando scene played, um, you know, in that you being a part of that as not only as a as a as a fan and a and a, a top rocker, I guess as they call it, right? <laughs> Correct. Um, Correct. Yeah. You know, uh, taking that on to um, being a promoter and you know hustling on the streets for three years, um, not necessarily making any money, just out there showing that you had the passion and the belief in, in what you, um, you know, and, and what you saw in this as, as a f uh, for future for you. And it ultimately took that on to uh, building your career and doing, you know, bigger shows in Miami, um, down in Ultra and, and ultimately, uh, you know, with, with, with your mentor and, 
and uh, creating something that was unique and different. And I, I think there's a lot to be said from that. I also think that there's a lot to be learned from that as, as a younger guy coming up. Um, and it, it's very inspirational to see the work that you've done as an independent promoter over uh, well over a decade of being in this industry. Um, the, the list, the list, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of, uh, trying to think of what else that we, we covered here and so I can wrap it, wrap it up. Oh, the DJ names in terms of how to reach out. Uh, we talked about DJs reaching out to ind independent promoters or promoters in general. Uh, some of the things that you talked about was being professional, uh, with your approach, um, having, um, not necessarily saying you have to ha change your D DJ name, but having the right look, um, and, and being professional when you reach out. Uh, so that's pretty much, oh, I'm sorry. And lastly, I can't forget this. Uh, and I think this is vital. Uh, this is important. Uh, an important part of, of this interview was being able to talk about the current, addressing some of the current issues that we see in the dance music scene um, in terms of uh, things, how things have grown very quickly um, and in terms of how the mainstream media has kind of um, embraced EDM or dance music culture, if you will, um, and kind of, uh, I don't want to say diluted it a little bit, but, you know, as you were saying, um, and as we all know, um, even the people listening to this or watching this, you know, as as something becomes popular, it kind of, um, I don't want to say loses its value, but it's cool, it's hip, and everyone's doing it. So uh, I think some of the important things that we took away is maintaining the integrity in whatever it is that you do um, and being original and having passion for what you do. So uh, that pretty much wraps it up. And uh, I want to thank you again for taking this time out of your out of your evening. I know you're incredibly busy with the reunion coming up. And uh, everybody should be there August 31st, by the way. Yes, so. sir. Uh, I, I'd like to, in closing, I'd like to just touch on your bullet points real quick, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. All right. I'd just like to say um, on these last few topics that you just touched on, I'd like to um, – uh, oh. um, sorry, that, that was my cat. I was going to introduce everyone to Duchess, but uh, anyways, um, she ran off. She's a little crazy like that. So uh, anyways, as far as um, – just to touch on a couple of last things that you said, one, I want to say in closing that – Everything about me and my work and everything you're saying that it's inspirational and my whole journey and like everything that I've accomplished as an independent promoter and et cetera, I will say it's very surreal. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you very much. I appreciate the props. I'm very honored. Um, I just follow my heart with this. So thank you. I do sincerely appreciate it. Um, I will say that my – the whole thing is surreal for me because frankly for me to start out as a dancer – and to just like flyers and have a passion for marketing and advertising. My mom happens to own a real estate magazine, so she builds designs and lays out stuff all the time each month. She's a proprietor, you know, owns her own publication. Well, um, she's inspired me because I think she's rubbed off on me over the years and kind of gave me an eye for design, helped me kind of, I guess you could say, find, in addition to college, of course. She helped me fine tune my skills, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I love you to death for that, mom, whether she realizes that she did that or not. She did. Um, so that de it's just surreal for me to overall go from being a dancer and being in the scene and being, quote, a partier back in the day. And then to have a love for the designs and the marketing angles of things and then knowing that I was the people person and I just was social. It wasn't a strategy of mine, to be completely honest. It was just. A, it was just me feel, doing and feeling what felt natural to do and was just socializing, networking, put, having my heart in the right place, following my passions, like you said. And uh, passion is the nucleus for me. You know, I mean, that's a, kind of a saying of mine that I say that really deep down, passion is what ultimately drives me every day to continue to do my work and to try to excel at what I do is the passion that I have inside that I like to exude. So – that overall is kind of how all this happened. It's very surreal to me that I'm still doing this stuff that I've been doing for so many years and I'm still doing it and I'm able to make a living off it and everything. I, 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 you know, I, I, I thank God every day for that. I appreciate you very much. And, um, that, that overall is, uh, is a great thing. So that makes me happy. And as far as, um, yeah, overall, I guess, you know, that's, that's my thoughts. And 
there, but there was one other thing that you said at the end, that, that the, the other bullet points. The, oh, in terms of DJs, that I will say that this is something very simple. And this is my, my problem, my, my number one thing that I could give advice to DJs out there. Before you pick a DJ name, okay, because there are a few of them out there. It doesn't really matter if the D, I'm not talking about the people that I don't necessarily like their DJ names because everybody has their own take on things. There might be some type of symbolic meaning behind why they chose that name. You know, more power to you. It's a free world. Do whatever you want. Everybody's got different tastes in this world. What I will say, though, and the only thing that I do have an issue with is those that pick a DJ name, and there's a few that I've seen out there, and I'm not going to put them on blast, but it's called Google.com. You Google <laughs> something, and you research it, and you make sure that there isn't an original boss that already holds that name. I can think of one guy in the state of Florida that is repping a name of one of the original bosses of Florida that still tours today and is a major headliner and trying to use the exact same name with the exact same spelling. You can't do that. I'm sorry. You're never going to go anywhere. If you don't know the roots of where you come from and you're trying to do something in this scene, have a little bit of respect and make sure that you're not riding somebody else's coattails and, as we like to say, swagger jacking somebody. Don't be swagger jacking <laughs> because that's not a good look. People are not going to respect you for that. Google.com. It's a great invention. That's all I got to say. <laughs> well, Glenn, thanks, man. Uh, we appreciate having you on uh, Live by the Beat, and uh, I'll be in touch. Absolutely, bro. I appreciate you, man. Much respect. Live by the Beat. Thank you for your time. I wish you guys nothing but the, the much, much success. Thank you, sir. Cheers. No doubt. Much respect. Salute. Salute.